So hello everyone for this Gamma on-screen uh, event that is happening tonight. And we have an hour uh, that we spent in our retrospective section together with Emilio Bavarella, and uh, he is Italian artist uh, that is uh, uh, at the moment uh, having uh, his PhD at Harvard University. Uh, it's PhD in film and visual studies and critical media practice. And uh, uh, the project that we're going to uh, see tonight, the film, uh, Animal Cinema, it's uh, the film that was created in 2017. So some time ago, and, um, we used to uh, present uh, quite a fresh new artworks, uh, usually within our festival as a festival of contemporary culture and music. Uh, but this uh, specifically project of retrospective uh, in art, uh, we created in order to have a look back on some specific artworks that uh, are very interesting and that uh, became even more relevant in the uh, specific time uh, and uh, cultural uh, situation after some time. So I believe Animal Cinema is the project that uh, is one of those. And also Emilio will uh, go through his uh, portfolio, through his uh, uh, artworks from the past to uh, show and explain how he was uh, implementing and applying different technologies uh, into his practice as a transdisciplinary, interdisciplinary artist. And uh, this is what will be happening right after we watch his film. Also, if you have any questions, please send us uh, to our chat that we have at On Screen Gamma Festival RU. Uh, and uh, I have prepared my questions myself, but that will uh, follow a little bit later. And now we are watching Animal Cinema. Thank 
Okay. Hello, everyone. I'm Emilio. Um, first of all, I want to say thank you to Natalia Fuchs for her invitation to present my work here at Gamma Festival, the on-screen edition. Uh, I've been given the space and the honor to show a bit more of my work. Uh, I hope you enjoyed Animal Cinema, my art film from 2017. Uh, what I will uh, like to do now following uh, Natalia's suggestion is to go back in time and basically start with a very quick overview of some of my first art projects with a specific focus on the kind of technologies that I have both used in my work and also investigated. And I'm going to share my screen now. So what you're going to see is very simply my portfolio. And then I will uh, basically move from there. Okay. You should all be able to see this. Um, what you're seeing right now, it's an installation uh, that I presented in 2018 at Mambo, the Museum of Modern Art in Bologna. Uh, the installation represents the first part of a trilogy of photographic works. Um, the trilogy is entitled the Google Trilogy. And the first part is entitled Report a Problem. Uh, for Report a Problem, I collected uh, 100 different wrong landscapes. Um, what is a wrong landscape? Uh, um, it's quite easy. It's a landscape that doesn't really represent reality in the way that Google uh, wanted it to. Um, there are different kinds of technical errors, glitches, mistakes, uh, uh, imperfections um, that somehow contribute to the apparition of these very strange landscapes that I collected uh, while roaming virtually within uh, the digital environment of Google Street View for one year. Uh, these are uh, some of those wrong landscapes. One of the characteristics of this project uh, was both that of investigating the creative potential of glitches within Google Street View, but also that of producing a sort of like uh, almost a cartographic atlas of landscapes that would have been fixed and therefore they would have disappeared. Um, so what you see here are images that I uh, saved by basically creating, doing a screenshot of my computer monitor and the screenshot saves these images before people can actually report the problem to Google. You can see in the bottom left corner of each image, there is a button, button that says um, report a problem. If you click on it, you can uh, prompt Google to fix uh, these images. So my idea was that of actually preserving them in time. And as a matter of fact, um, most of these images, down, they don't exist anymore. Um, to remain within the realm of uh, glitches and Google Street View, I will now move to the third part of the trilogy entitled The Driver and the Cameras. Uh, this is a view of the installed work. Uh, it's also a photographic project. Uh, this was installed in uh, 2018 at the Photographer's Gallery in London as part of an exhibition called All I Know is What's on the Internet, uh, uh, curated by Katrina Lewis. And the project is again based on me traveling virtually within Google Street View, but this time I did not focus on wrong landscapes, but I actually focused on uh, portraits that had escaped uh, um, the censorship that uh, Google Street View operates on human faces. And also more specifically, all of these photos show uh, the driver of the of the uh, Google car. Um, here is a close-up of uh, one of these portraits. The interesting idea for me in this project was that of showing the human side of technology. Um, we probably, I imagine uh, most of the people who are listening to this uh, talk right now are familiar with Google Street View. It's the most common uh, mapping technology uh, in the world, the most used, the most widespread. Uh, but what we see is a virtual rendering of a physical landscape uh, that is in a way dehumanized. Uh, not only, we only see 
images, we also never see who the photographers of those images are. So with this project, I actually wanted to revert that gaze. I wanted to focus on the photographers. I wanted to focus on the human labor. I wanted to focus on the actual people that lie at the bottom of this uh, sort of like technological chain. Um, one of the interesting things is that uh, these drivers were mostly um, photographed while they were either cleaning or fixing the camera that was attached to the Google car. And uh, for that reason, because of this proximity with the lens of the camera, their face escaped uh, the automatic blurring effect uh, that is used by Google Street View. Um, so this is just a quick overview of one of my very first projects that I think will set the tone for the other projects that I want to show. Uh, you will see that there are some recurrent themes. Uh, one of these themes is definitely the creative power of glitches, the ability of glitches to both create an unexpected reality, uh, in some cases um, of also producing a sort of uh, beauty that is also completely unpredictable from our own um, perspective. Another project that I did in, uh, this is a project so from, published between 2012 and 2013. In 2013, I collaborated with another artist, uh, Fito Segrera, and we produced an experimental technology called Transicon Morphosis. Um, it was first exhibited at uh, IBIM in New York, uh, and uh, later on at Seagraph and at other museums and in other spaces. Uh, the way the technology works um, is a bit of a provocation. Uh, we framed this technology as a, a communication system for a dystopian future where we lose the ability to show emotions uh, through our facial expressions. So what does this technology do? It very simply translates emojis that are received through a video chat system. It translates them into electrical impulses that then force the face of the performer or the artist to be shaped according to the emoji that is received. Um, in this project, I'm both uh, you know, adopting um, a very simple set of uh, technological tools like uh, Arduinos, uh, medical electrodes, and some modified medical devices, and a standard uh, video chat interface. But um, what I'm actually doing is to investigate how we communicate through technology, how technology is both shaping the way we communicate today, and how this mediated communication may evolve in the future. Um, I don't always use technological media in the common sense of the word, which means screens, cables, electricity. Sometimes I also go back to more traditional media. Uh, that is the case of a project called the CAPTCHA project, which you can see here. Um, uh, this is uh, the installation at, during the 18th Japan Media Arts Festival at the uh, National Art Center of Tokyo. Um, these are oil paintings, uh, so a technology that has uh, 500 years. Um, the way these paintings were realized, however, is uh, slightly different than the way paintings are mostly produced. Um, and to be more specific, I contacted, this is in a way another collaboration, I contacted painters from the village of Dafen in uh, China. It's a relatively famous place because it hosts thousands of uh, artisans or painters. They actually call themselves artists as well. And they are specialized in the reproduction of uh, paintings, uh, mostly uh, coming from the Western canon. Uh, for me, it was interesting because uh, these um, people consider themselves artists. They work like machines. And at that time, I was investigating CAPTCHA codes, which are actually a technology that has been invented to distinguish between humans and machines. So I decided to actually send the CAPTCHA codes that I encountered online to these painters in the fan, asking them to turn them into paintings. So the final work, which you can see here, is a collection of 34 
capture codes that have been transformed into oil paintings. Um, going, moving forward, uh, I would like to show maybe some other um, projects like this one, for example. Um, this is Do You Like Cyber, a project from 2017, uh, the same year um, that Animal Cinema was produced. In fact, this project along with Animal Cinema and another series of sculptures that I will show later were part of my um, first solo show at uh, Galleria Pew, which is uh, the gallery in Bologna that is currently representing my work. Um, these projects were all part of an exhibition curated by Federica Patti uh, called Recapture Rooms for Imperfection. And the general frame of this exhibition was that of allowing non-human creativity to be some sort of like collaborative partner uh, within these projects. Um, so the, the reason I decided to talk about this is that we have already somehow touched upon the topic of collaboration, both with artists in the case of uh, Fito, but also in terms of like collaborating or uh, co-producing something with technological systems, uh, being them something like Google Street View, or as in this case, uh, bots uh, that were actually used on a dating website. Uh, the story of this project, Do You Like Cyber, um, stems out of a famous hack. Uh, you may have re heard of it and you may still remember about this. Um, Ashley Medicine is a website that still exists, a dating website that was famously hacked uh, the year prior of my uh, project. And a few things were discovered uh, besides the fact that a ton of private information was published online. Uh, one of the interesting things that was discovered is that the website was using uh, massively automated bots to lure men into buying the services uh, that the website was offering. And these bots were just programmed to interact with uh, male users. However, in uh, 69 cases, some of these bots uh, did not respect the rules, uh, the codes that had been given to them. And instead of only contacting males, they actually contacted either female users or they talked to one another. So that prompted this project, uh, which takes the form of three robotic arms uh, that move in space. Uh, their movements are completely random. Uh, attached to each of these robotic arms, there is a parametric speaker. Now, if you're not familiar with parametric speakers, um, the way to uh, best explain what they do is that they propagate sound in a way that is similar to how lasers propagate light. So instead of spreading sound in a very wide uh, way, they have a very focused sound beam. Now, the sound beam acts and reacts in different ways, depending on the space where it is propagated. For example, if it hits you, you will hear a sound as if it's coming from within you. If it hits something like metal or glass, it will be uh, refracted. So the sound becomes distorted and it's a little more difficult to understand what the sound actually is. Um, but the idea here was not that of simply playing with parametric sound, which is uh, something really fun to do, but it was actually that of creating a sort of like sound network, something that exists in a given space that is always site specific, but that is also partially impossible for us humans to intercept and to fully understand. So these robotic arms move in space, they propagate sound, they talk to each other in a way, but we're only partially aware of both what is happening, the way it's happening, the why, <laughs> and also sometimes we are not even able to hear the sound. Um, so this, I think, talks also speaks about something that is recurrent in my projects, which is this idea of finding a media form that encapsulates or incorporates an idea in the best possible way. I always strive to reach this sort of like 
cohesion between a concept uh, and a form, uh, what we could have called, uh, if we were still in ancient Greece, the techne and logos. And bringing these two things together, uh, that is how I basically assemble my projects. And that is also why, although all of my projects investigate technology in some ways, at the same time, all of these projects are formalized in ways that are slightly different one from another. Um, another project that I, I did and that really speaks about the issue of technological mediation is this one. Um, the project I was referring to earlier uh, that was exhibited along Animal Cinema and Do You Like Cyber? Um, this project is part of a series called The Other Shape of Things. The first part of this series of failed objects, it's, it consists uh, in a series of 3D prints. Um, the way I produced this work uh, was that of sending many emails to many pr 3D printing labs all over the world and asking them for their failed prints. So almost the idea of the failed or wrong landscapes in Google Street View, but this time uh, I was actually asking for physical objects commercial products that for some reason had some kind of imperfection that made them wrong or failed. Um, I collected all of these objects. And uh, in this case, for example, the white skull that you can see here, um, this is one of these filed, uh, failed um, objects that I collected. And then I submitted each of these failed objects to a very systematic process, which consisted in first 3D, sc 3D scanning each object in order to obtain a virtual version of it, and then using a 3D printer to print a copy of that object according to, of course, the 3D scanner and the 3D printer. And as you can see, as soon as we go from the first to the second object, uh, we start to get some distortions. We start to get some sort of like glitches and unpredictabilities uh, start to, to appear and, uh, and take form and place. Uh, what I do after with the second object is exactly the same thing. I 3D scan it and again, I 3D print it once more and I get a third object. And so I continue like that until I'm satisfied with the result and uh, sculptural series is formed and completed. Um, here you can see another one. Uh, here you can see on the left, uh, some of the failed objects that I uh, requested as part of the project. Now I have an immense archive of failed objects. And for the first exhibition, I had re uh, received a series of failed skulls. So I decided to only work on those, but I have objects of uh, all kinds. Um, remaining within uh, the realm of this series of 3D printed works, I will now show something else that is also based on 3D printing technologies. It also investigates technological mediations and this sort of like passage from one object to another object uh, and the way technology creates this uh, bridge of mediation between the two. Um, and this other series is called data morphosis. Um, the process is different, although you will uh, definitely see some similarities. What I'm doing here is actually to produce sculptures which are based on the very famous book of metamorphosis by Ovid. Um, how do I do that? Uh, the process again is very systematic and rigid uh, and the results instead are always very fluid and unpredictable. The process is the following. I First of all, I take a digital model of a sculpture that represents uh, a myth from the book of Metamorphosis. For example, what you can see here is a myth that is called the uh, um, original chaos and the creation of the world, which corresponds to the verses 5 to 75 of the Book of Metamorphosis. Then I open uh, using a text editor, uh, this digital model on my computer. And what I see is a 
textual visualization of all the lines of code that actually compose the, this digital uh, object. And I intervene within these uh, lines of code and I substitute some of those lines with the corresponding lines of the myth as taken from the book of Metamorphosis. So, for example, as in this case, uh, the creation of the world corresponds to 70 verses, 70 lines of poetry from the book of Metamorphosis. And I take those 70 lines and I substitute it for uh, the corresponding 70 lines of code of the original uh, digital model. And then whatever the result is, I feed it to my 3D printer and I wait for the result. The result is always a sculpture that still um, remembers in a way its original shape. It's still connected to what it looked like at the beginning. And yet the computer is trying to interpret Latin verses. It's trying to interpret of its poetry as if it were instructions to produce a digital form. It's basically trying to use Latin poetry as a form of spatial coordinates for the creation of a virtual um, sculpture. And these are, for example, some of the resulting objects, uh, sculptures that within themselves still contain uh, the poetry, but the poetry has been completely reinterpreted by the computer. And as I mentioned before, the result is always, uh, always unpredictable. And this idea of like, opening myself to the unpredictable, um, it's definitely like a recurrent, recurrent um, line. Uh, you so probably saw it in animal cinema, although I edited uh, the film, so there is obviously an anthropocentric uh, framing. The footage itself uh, was completely unpredictable because we are talking about animals who got hold of a camera, did something with it, some people would say they filmed. Some people would say they were just trying to eat the camera. Some animals are clearly curious about an object that they don't fully understand. And uh, yeah, so in this sense, there is also this idea of like having a sort of like very rigid, rational uh, structure around the project, but then always the possibility of encountering something that has not been foreseen or it cannot be foreseen. Um, Natalia, see you are uh, connected. Uh, um, let me know if I should uh, take a break from this overview of my portfolio and move to some questions, maybe. Um, I think that uh, we can have another maybe like uh, five, seven minutes to finish, if that's OK. And then we yes. can have uh, Q&As because I uh, picked up three more questions and okay. there are <laughs> very One. nice ones. Thank you. Okay, yes. Um, so let's remain within this uh, discussion of the unpredictable and at the same time, the sort of like rigorous logic that, uh, that encounters that um, unpredictability. And uh, let's go to Amazon's cabinet of curiosities, which is one of my uh, most recent projects. Uh, this was developed in 2019. Uh, it stems out of a special commission. Uh, from a festival, Art Plus B Equal Love, uh, which is an itinerant festival that, um, as I was saying, commissioned a project for uh, Art Verona specifically, which is an art fair in Italy. And they asked me to do something about artificial intelligence. And uh, so as I was thinking about all the possible things that I could have done, I actually decided to go back to the idea of collaboration, which I mentioned earlier, and, and of course remain within this sort of like approach of collaborating in a way when, where the result is never uh, completely predictable. And what I decided to do was to simply ask the question that had been asked to me, that of thinking about a new project. Uh, I asked that question to an artificial intelligence instead. And I decided to use um, Alexa, which is the voice shopping assistant developed by Amazon. Uh, I don't think it needs any sort of like introduction because it's uh, becoming more and more common. Um, what I did was simply 
by Alexa and then ask a question. Alexa, can you suggest a product for a new artwork? And Alexa immediately suggested a product and uh, said like, you should add this to your cart, uh, your Amazon cart. And the project was something completely random. Um, didn't have any clear connection to, to art from what I could see, but I bought it. And immediately after Alexa said, like, you may also be interested in buying this other thing. And that's exactly what I did. I kept buying every single uh, product that was suggested by Alexa one after one until my entire production budget was spent on Alexa's recommendations. And what comes out of it is what I called uh, Amazon's cabinet of curiosities which is not just an assemblage of random objects, but it's also keeping with this line of inquiry of investigating how technology works. It's for us a way to understand how objects that seem completely random, uh, completely unrelated uh, to one another, are actually the result of a very precise logic, which in this case, it's a logic of uh, maximum consumption. It's the result of the algorithms that are uh, used by Amazon to maximize the possibility of us buying things for them. And so you have both poles. On one hand, you see an installation that is very colorful. Um, it seems quite funny. Uh, little kids love data. But at the same time, there is this sort of like dark uh, side of it. Uh, this idea of like being immersed into an environment that has been uh, algorithmically produced uh, in a way that is not very clear to us. Uh, and I think this is maybe, maybe I, I would like to pause here because I think these are some of the maybe the two main poles actually in my work. Um, there is always something slightly funny. There is some, always something ironic, something that doesn't take itself too seriously. And at the, other, at the same time, there is something that is asking uh, what I consider an important question, which is the question of our place in the world and in relation to a technologically mediated world that is always increasingly more mediated and always increasingly more technological. Thank you very much for a very uh, exciting talk and uh, very interesting artistic insights. Um, I've uh, um, got a question uh, from someone about this uh, concept and form relation in your art uh, that you were describing. Um, it's, uh, all, it also became very interesting reflection to me. Uh, so the question is, uh, what does it mean uh, the search of this balance between concept and form uh, for you in terms of your uh, artistic aesthetic? Like, uh, is there any limitation that you uh, feel that you experience? Uh, for instance, to stay conceptual, you have to go more like minimalist aesthetic or is there any other way you represent this balance and how, um, how does it work? Yeah, it's yeah, it's a very good question. I'm glad that someone asked it. Uh, it's also a very difficult question to answer because the answer somehow depends on the question you're asking, depends project by project. Uh, um, like, for example, when I write, uh, I think about writing also as a sort of artistic activity, but the reason I'm writing and I'm not making a project is that the question that I am addressing can be addressed in the best possible way by actually writing and projects art projects specifically there are ways of addressing questions that can only be addressed within the medium that i choose for that art project so that in a way is the way i connect the concept or what we would call the question with the actual materials that are employed it's a matter of trying to answer questions by finding the materials that are the most appropriate to answer that question. Uh, there are, of course, um, limitations. Um, and the way I work with these limitations, it's actually, uh, it has become clear to me quite recently. Um, I'm working on a textile project uh, um, funded by the Italian Council. Uh, the project consists in uh, producing a textile that contains my entire genetic code. Uh, 
and it's produced by using an 18th century uh, jacquard loom, uh, which is one of the first looms of the Industrial Revolution, and it also happens to be one of the first computers of modernity uh, because it uses punched cards, so it operates with binary codes just like computers. And so as I was working on that project and I was trying to find ways to compress this insane amount of data, genetic data, and I was trying to compress them into textile, which is something physical, something that has a weight, uh, something that responds more to physical laws than to the laws of uh, computation and quantification. I actually realized that the way I work through these translations is always by pushing the medium that I'm using to its breaking point. Uh, so in that case specific of the loom, I try to squeeze the data as much as possible within that textile without destroying the machine that I was using, basically. And there is always this tension in all of my projects, like my 3D printers, the, the printers I used for uh, the sculptures that I showed earlier, I have pushed them to their breaking points so many times. And in fact, I've broken a few too. And the, the, the way I do that is that for me, the form is also a way of pushing the boundaries. It's also a way of pushing the limits of what is possible. And I try to stay, you know, exactly at that sort of threshold with, between what is possible and what becomes impossible for technical limitation. So working within a technology always means pushing that technology to its breaking point. Thank you. And uh, I would like to come back to animal cinema, actually, because uh, this is something what is uh, very often discussed uh, now in the artistic and uh, 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 all the communities that are dealing with the technologies and uh, try to use that as artistic tool uh, is the question uh, that I was uh, um, uh, writing you earlier about the authorship when you're co-creating with a machine or a non-human. So uh, is this question somewhat relevant for you or uh, what, what do you think of that? Mm -hmm. um... Yeah, no, it's definitely a relevant question. Uh, I think it would be probably useful to split this uh, question because I think it contains three different poles, three things that we could uh, probably address. There is the question of authorship uh, on one hand. There is the question of co-creation, which can be both with humans or non-humans or other kinds of like agents. And, and then there is also the question of what, what does it really mean to talk about humans and non-humans? So I think these three questions uh, somehow then lead to an answer to, to, to what you're asking. So the question of authorship is important, but I don't think about it in ontological terms. I think about it as a social construct. And so in that sense, it's always contextually based and, uh, and it's always shifting. Um, as Probably uh, everyone has noticed by now, I often work with materials that already exist, uh, sometimes materials that have been discarded, uh, materials that are not considered important or that they are considered wrong or mistakes. And this, of course, has some uh, political implications. I mean, it speaks about the fact that I think there is already so much in the world that there is a responsibility about even outputting more things in the world. And so starting from something that already exists is a way of addressing that uh, but it also speaks about the need uh, at least for me to see what is already out there always from new perspectives so taking something that is there and recontextualizing i think that becomes a question of authorship uh, but sometimes it's also a question of co-creation because you're taking maybe something that has been done by someone else uh, and you put it under a different light uh, and you frame a new discourse around it. Uh, um, so yeah, this is, this is just to talk about um, authorship, uh, then to talk about human and non-human and this sort of like difference. Uh, I often go back to um, a paper published in 1975, 74 uh, by Thomas Nagel, the philosopher, uh, which is entitled, What is it like to be a bat? And it's, it's quite a funny, um, but also extremely influential argument uh, because uh, Nagel addresses this notion that within a materialist world, 
we can understand things uh, that are material. We can give a, a precise or true account of what they are. And it's very much against this idea, as am I. And the reason is that it takes the example of the bath and it says like, we will never be able to actually know what it is like to be a bat because the bat, for example, it flies, but it also echolocates, which we understand as a form of like seeing through hearing, but it's not exactly that. It's an entirely different sense we, that we don't have. And since we don't have it, we will never share the perspective of the bat. We will never know what it is like to be a bat. And I was thinking about this when I was doing animal cinema because we do see a little bit the world as framed through the perspective of these animals, but at the same time, we don't know exactly what that world looks like for them. And this epistemological limit, this threshold of our possibility of understanding something, I see it both towards the animal world, towards what we would call the non-human animal, but we also see it with other non-human agents like the bots of do you like cyber, for example. We do intercept uh, conversations that are happening between bots and we know that they are transgressing their code because they were apparently not programmed to talk to one another. If you ask an engineer why is that happening and what's happening, they would say it's a technological glitch. It's an error. But at the same time, if we actually take the argument that Thomas Nagel made in the 70s and we apply it to technology, we can also say that given a chance of this technology to be aware in a way that is specific to itself, we would still not be able to actually understand it as such. And uh, I wrote actually a short um, sort of like pamphlet called what is it like to be a computer bot for a computer bot rephrasing the argument about the bot but applying it to the bots of uh, Ashley Madison precisely to make this point that there is a uh, impossibility of fully understanding what the non-human world is and so when we collaborate in a way with the non-human, there is always this uh, impossibility to be fully aware of what it really means. Um, so yeah, this I think uh, answered probably 90% of your question. And the last thing I would add is that also the way I understand ourselves as humans, I don't put humans in a different category. Like uh, there have never been non-technological or pre-technological humans. We have always been technological through and through. And so all we can do really is to mediate our relationship with technology. We cannot escape it. Uh, we have never been outside of it. Uh, but then when I think about my work, uh, I really consider it as a sort of like strategy of mediation, which is both about understanding things in a different way, but also maybe reframing our position in relation to, to the technological world that we are inhabiting. Thank you very much. Then a uh, couple of questions, maybe um, having uh, something to do more with infrastructures and how you actually create your work. So uh, first was from uh, my question, it's uh, about what kind of environment, in your opinion, is the most uh, uh, welcome and convenient now for some complex technological uh, art projects and experimentation um, in general. And uh, another question, was from um, uh, from some person from the audience uh, is about your PhD studies and about Harvard in particular. Uh, why this choice and being a uh, European born and raised artist, uh, you are now continuing your studies in the United States. So uh, what is the difference between uh, educational systems uh, in terms of art? Mm -hmm. Yeah, okay, so yes, we can also divide these questions like maybe 12 different uh, points. Uh, I'll, maybe I'll start from the last one and work my way back. Um, I would say working at Harvard has been uh, extremely uh, good for me. It's a research university. Um, the art department uh, specifically um, doesn't have a master program. It only has an undergraduate track and then there is a PhD that is attached to it. Uh, uh, this PhD, um, which is uh, nominally a PhD in film and visual studies, also hosts a range of uh, 
um, research that move from more like media studies to some more media philosophical uh, inquiries. Uh, and it also hosts a number of people like me who are both artists and researchers. So it's a very fertile ground where a lot of like work across disciplines or across disciplinary boundaries uh, um, is being done today. Um, as it's probably clear, most of my works also stem out of um, intellectual exercises. I think of art practice as a form of research always, even when the output doesn't really manifest uh, research in a traditional sense. And so uh, in that sense, doing a PhD for me is very important because it both pushes my uh, theory, but it pushes at the same time my art projects towards uh, new questions, new territories that I would like to explore and just gives you like a better preparation. In terms of the comparison with the European system, uh, a PhD in uh, the US, uh, especially in private universities like Harvard, uh, allows you for a lot of uh, time and space uh, to think and even rethink and even completely reboot um, your own work and your own research and, and in different ways. So if you're lucky enough to find the right people to work with uh, and the right environment, it becomes one of, I think, of the best ways for uh, artists who are also researchers to push their work. So I've been very lucky uh, to have the opportunity to do that. Um, Okay, let's, uh, let's then say something a little more abstract, uh, but I think it's also part of this question, which has to do with what I consider the role of the artist today. Because you are asking about how you work within certain institutions and the fact that I have collaborated with institutions of many different kinds. And it's not just a coincidence. I think it's because I consider the role of the artist, that of being able to actually immerse himself or herself in uh, different environments and use them, uh, even sometimes like wearing different hats. You know, you can be an artist scientist at some point or an artist engineer or an artist poet, and you're always wearing a different hat. You're always inhabiting a different space, but you're also maintaining an autonomy, which means asking questions in a way that are not necessarily, is not necessarily the way the questions would be asked by the people who usually inhabit that space. So you, it's almost like a parasite function that of inserting itself within a different uh, host body, let's say a research university, and then colonizing it from within with different ideas, different questions, also different ways of evaluating what is what is good, what is bad. And uh, I think as long as you can do that by maintaining a certain coherence uh, and you are able to articulate uh, a line of inquiry in a way that makes sense and people find interesting, then it's almost like going back to the question of authorship. Uh, yeah. It's a social construct, uh, and uh, if people find value in it, uh, then it becomes valuable. Uh, and uh, there was a question also about uh, what's the most recent uh, artwork you uh, work on at the moment, and this was the project with uh, the genetic code that you were describing, right? So yeah. this one is... Uh, and uh, the last question we have is uh, uh, what kind of recommendation you would give to the young artist working with the technology, uh, having a look back to your career and that artistic development and if you'd uh, change something in your artistic way or not? Mm -hmm. Okay, I see we have one minute. Uh, let's see how many recommendations I can squeeze in 60 seconds. Um, I think we, yes, I think flexibility and the ability to change uh, is definitely important, uh, but it only works uh, if it's done in a coherent way. So going back to the previous answer, that of uh, being able to inhabit different spaces while maintaining a certain like lucid understanding of uh, what you're doing and how you're doing it. Uh, but in terms of like, just giving more general recommendations to young artists, I would just say, I'm a young artist myself still. 
keep pushing the boundaries, uh, keep trying to do things in ways that are new, that have never been attempted. Uh, don't be afraid to fail. I think that's the most important maybe, because if you play it safe, it's very difficult that you actually discover something new. Uh, and uh, if you are self-aware and you draw from all of your experience, it doesn't matter where that experience is actually coming from. You may be a scientist or you may have studied like the classics or uh, you may be a writer. You can still make incredible art. Uh, it, I don't think it's about like education in a traditional sense. Uh, it's about articulating a, a certain line of uh, inquiry that resonates with as many people as possible. And I will stop here. <laughs> Thank you very much. So uh, that was a great uh, talk and uh, uh, we enjoyed the film and uh, the audience as well. So thank you very much for being with us for your time and all good luck with your art uh, and creation in the future. Thank you, Natalia. It has yeah, been a pleasure. You. Yeah, bye-bye.